you for the uh, online participants. Um, my name is Mike Sparrow. I'm the uh, head of the World Climate Research Division at WMO and look after the World Climate Research Program Secretariat. I'll be facilitating this session very shortly. I will hand over to Helen Clue, the vice chair of the World Climate Research Program, for the first uh, introductions. Just to say, uh, we have quite a tight schedule, so I will um, be quite strict on the timing. And I'll give uh, the speakers a uh, one minute warning before the end of their time slot. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Helen Clue now. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Mike. Um, can we get the first slide up, please? No, ah, good. Okay, there we go. So hi, hi everyone, and, and um, welcome to this event on climate information for decision making, which is jointly organised between uh, the World Climate Research Programme and Future Earth. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. It's really good to have you all here. As Mike has said, my name is Helen Clue, and I'm the uh, Vice Chair of WCRP's Joint Scientific Committee, and I'll be helping run this event today along with Mike. Our chair, Professor Detlef Stammer, sends his apologies. He couldn't make it today, but he did ask me to welcome you all um, to this event, and he looks forward to hearing the outcomes of the discussion. Just to briefly set the scene, um, the presentations that you're hearing here at COP and the recent IPC6 assessment report, of course, all paint a stark picture of the impacts and risks of, of anthropogenic climate change for our ecosystems, our communities, their health and the economy. The challenge of making rapid, large and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions is enormous, but it's critically important given that these impacts increase with every increment of warming. While we must focus on emissions reductions and the transition to a low carbon economy, society also needs credible, useful and usable climate information to better manage these impacts, build preparedness and adapt to the changes in our climate that are already underway. This information is needed at a scale that's meaningful to individuals and communities. In short, we need to bring society into our science. And that's really the theme of this event. We have, if we could just uh, click down, please. We have three exciting, what I've called sessions. So the talks come in three groups with a short time for questions in between each of these groups. All of these speakers that you see listed, and I'll come back to the slide in a minute. All of these speakers are valued, uh, either valued partner from valued partner organizations such as Future Earth and IPCC, or they're part of the World Climate Research Program. So I want to briefly explain a little bit about WCRP. So if we could go to the next slide, please. The World Climate Research Programme, or WCRP, coordinates climate science around the world to advance our understanding of the Earth's climate system and share and apply the knowledge to contribute to societal well-being, as you can see by our, our mission or purpose statement. WCRP was established over 40 years ago, and at that time it was exploring two key questions. The first is, what is the extent of the climate predictability? Could you please go back? I'll, I'll say next and I'm ready for the next slide. Um, the extent of climate predictability and the extent of humans influence on climate. After 40 years, we continue to lead the way in advancing the understanding of the coupled climate system. Whilst we also aim to provide climate information that meets the needs of decision makers, it's going to need new science and new technologies and new ways of co-designing knowledge. If we could go to the next slide. The scope of our research you'll see in the graphic on the right hand side in this slide when it comes up and it spans everything on the sort of from the observations and modeling capacity are we able to get the next slide up um, thank you um, through to understanding the changing nature of climate extremes and an in between addressing really critical questions and issues like what are the possible consequences if we consciously intervene in the climate system the enormous advances that climate science has made over the last four decades have benefited from wcrp's coordination and leadership it's helped us to build observing systems and develop climate models that can provide climate change projections into the centuries ahead 
if we could go to the next slide, please. WCRP's role in coordinating climate science is critically important for our IPCC assessments. This science enabled the IPCC sixth assessment report to unequivocally conclude that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2000 years, as you can see in the graph, which is from the sixth assessment, and that human activities have led to this warming through the release of climatically active constituents. So through WCRP, we can now monitor, simulate, project the global climate and provide climate information for use by government uh, for policy making, but also for decision making. So this brings us back to today's event. And I'll, this is my last slide of my piece, I'll just bring it up, which is really about addressing WCRP's goal of bridging climate science and society. As I said, we have these three sessions, uh, each of the speakers will introduce themselves and their topic. So all that remains for me to say now is that if you wish to ask questions, and we hope you do, um, if you're online, please enter those questions into the chat. I'll monitor the chat and Mike will take questions from the floor. So for now, I will hand over to our first speaker, Bruce Hewitson. Uh, and if we could bring up the next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks. Bruce, you've got eight minutes. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Bruce Hewitson. I'm co-lead of the Regional Information for Society core project of the WCRP, and I'm based in Africa, based at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I'm going to change the approach of how we normally talk about uh, regional information for society. Typically, or the normative approach is to get the climate scientists um, you get information from the climate scientists, you translate it and you deliver it to society. But I'm going to talk about bringing science, society into the science as a new or emerging development as is seen as really critical for informing the process. Uh, next slide, please. So on the left, there's a, a word cloud. Um, this was created recently, um, comes out of a survey we did with active research community scientists in Africa. And we asked them, what is your leading uh, research priority that you think is of value for society? And what is interesting, and in the word cloud and in the responses that we received from across Africa, the dominant uh, focus was on aspects of consequence and concern about climate change, not so much about the underlying physical climate science. So words like communities, resilience, health, finance, et cetera. This reflects a, a growing understanding that the physical climate science is important, but there's a, set, a shift in the locus towards where we actually link this into decision makers and policy. So conventionally, we would begin with the physical science, translate it, hopefully, to relevant messages, communicate this through some boundary organization, which often leads to a partial understanding by the decision maker who tries to do some complicated conversion of that information into an action. But societal action takes place in a unique context and that context is full of non-climatic stresses, and they need to inform the research design, translation, and communication. And so when we talk about regional information for society, we need to take this on board. Uh, next slide, please. So just an example of the inverse of that, of science to society, this comes from the IPC Working Group 1 Atlas, which is an incredibly valuable and useful resource. But it creates a problem when you try to bring this into societal decision making. So I just highlighted a box there over Africa, where on the left hand side, we have 33 global climate models projecting a change in rainfall. On the right, we have 31 regional climate models from the Cortex experiment. And you can see there's some fundamental contrasts in there. And when you go as a delivery pipeline from the science activity through to society, the decision maker sits with this on their desk and they have a fundamental issue of what do I do with this? How do I handle this? Next slide, please. So a case example, um, one of the approaches we've done is to start looking at how context informs the science. And when you start at the, the, the context of what's happening on the ground, what the vulnerabilities, what the risk thresholds are, how do you manage that risk? Then you can start reframing the problem statements and thinking about different ways to pose the questions. Like when you talk about uncertainty, it's not about is it a change in rainfall plus or minus X, but is it about when or how much, what's the spread, or more interesting questions like what's the recurrence interval of an extreme event? 
And you can then go further up the chain and start thinking about how to optimize modes of communication. If you're talking to an agriculture union versus you're talking to a central government policy planner, um, you're working through a portal or you're doing face-to-face. -face. What about cultural language and value barriers? Um, and you can start reframing your communication paradigm. You can go further into the construction of the information. How is the information being constructed? Typically, scientists are focused on developing a conservative message that they're willing to defend on a scientific basis. But sometimes when you're dealing with a decision maker's option space, you need to think about the permutations around that that go broader than the more conservative approach and about the compound and cascading risks associated with that. All the way back up, you can take the context of the decision maker through to how do we design our research? Do we need more models or do we need bigger ensembles? Or do we critically need in this region a focus on biases? What about the metrics of robustness that are relevant to my decision space? Next slide, please. So here's a case example of just a, a touching on the top of something we did um, with, a, with a city in, in Africa, the city of Vintok in Namibia. Um, and this was part of a bigger project on the distillation of climate information through a pro program of transdisciplinary co-production. And historically, we would have said, there's a bunch of experts. They're gonna make assumptions about the information production. Um, and these experts are gonna make value choices about models, about methods, about how to frame uncertainty. And then this set of experts would then deliver this to a recipient, a user, in what is essentially a power dynamic. Um, even And the, this can lead to some significant confusion and misunderstandings, uh, potentially to maladaptation even. So inversely, we would begin with context, interrogate the context. Um, and after interrogating the context, we, can, we introduced climate risk narratives. And we said, here's a set of information that we framed in the context that we've interrogated, mapping out futures, mapping out uh, possibilities in the context of what you're facing. And we backed this with training of the city councillors focused on their underlying assumptions and try to build trust between their decision context as an equal peer with the disciplinary expert um, saying, well, let's just try and understand each other and, and what the limitations of what we face are. A number of learnings came out of that, such as how you frame the challenge ensures an appropriate design. And framing the challenge, stating the problem statement very carefully, makes a big difference in terms of the outcomes. There's also a very strong narrative around the barrier of uncertainty. And this really needs careful framing. Um, the typical scientific way of delivering uncertainty needs to be interrogated further and reframed in a way that makes more sense in the decision landscape and risk management. And that is an area of significant research and need at the moment. And another outcome was you really engender strong ownership and trust from the decision makers when they are brought into the process right from the start and they're engaged with the information design and production. Next slide, please. So this leads us to the Regional Information for Society core project, which I, I co-chair uh, along with two others. Um, and the diagram there is just a structure diagram of how it fits in the WLCRP, which is, is not that so important at this point. But what we do have is we have a science plan for research that is carefully designed about being contextually aware. The design of the research is saying, we do this research in the context of society. We want to generate scale appropriate information. We want to translate to relevant information and that's not just a case of asking the, the stakeholder, what do you need? It's a case of stepping into the stakeholder's shoes and trying to understand the dynamics of their non-climatic stresses uh, and situation they're operating in. One, and one then, minute, thank you. And then we are focusing strongly on what are the communication modalities with society? Rather than just handing over, how can we engage and bring the stakeholders on board in the communication process um, so they better understand the information relevancy and robustness? And in that framework, we really invite uh, organizations, agencies, individuals to engage with the uh, RIFs, to talk about supporting regional actions, to talk about informing the RIFs research around the different contexts, because it's such a heterogeneous world that we live in, uh, particularly around developing networks and capacity building both of the decision makers as well of the scientists about each other's contexts. And I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Perfect timing. Um, and we'll go off across to uh, Regina Rodriguez. Um, and you have uh, eight minutes, Regina. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Regina Rodriguez from the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And this talk will focus on some activities that Shepherd and I'm developing with WCRP. It's a lighthouse activity that we co-chair called uh, My Climate Risk. 
and it's the main goal is to develop a new framework for assessing and explaining regional climate risk to deliver climate information that is meaningful at local scale, in particular in places where climate services are not available, mainly in the global south. Uh, for decades, there has been a call for uh, usable uh, or actionable climate information, yet despite this awareness and global effort, it is widely accepted that there is a significant gap between the production and use of climate information. And we argue that the gap results in part from focus on better data rather than better decision making. Next, please. Um, so even if, uh, if user-informed, such a top-down approach adopts disciplinary-based measures of scientific quality, it is still inevitably driven by climate scientists themselves. It does violate the core principles of co-production, pro co which has a rich legacy in sustainability studies. In order to be useful, uh, climate change science has to break with the traditional research assessment policy paradigm, just as Bruce said and bring into existence a community of user. Hence the title for my talk, Inverting the Construction of Climate Information for Local to Regional Climate Risk. We believe that the science itself can be reconfigured to be more fit for purpose. In other words, making the research useful in the context of climate adaptation and local climate risk. The challenges are first, dealing with the complexity of local situation, which can be addressed by expressing climate knowledge in a conditional form, Second, the importance of simplicity when dealing with deep uncertainty, which can be addressed through the use of a physical climate store lines or narratives. Uh, a third aspect is the need to empower local communities to make sense of their own situation. More details can be found in this study entitled Small is Beautiful, uh, which I published recently with Ted uh, Shepard in PNAS. Uh, next, please. Uh, so to make things concrete, I briefly show a case study in South America, which illustrates the nature of the challenge. In Austral summer of 2013-14, Eastern South America experienced one of its worst recorded droughts in the left panel. Associated with the drought, extremes of air temperature occurred over land, and at the same time, an unprecedented marine heat waves developed in the Western South Atlantic. You can see that in the middle panel. These compound extreme events were associated with the failure of the South American monsoon system and led to water and power shortages in Southeast Brazil, reduced Brazil soy, coffee, and sugarcane production, impact food supplies globally, and increasing worldwide price. It impacted agriculture and fishery and affected human health by increasing the risk of heat strokes and vet borne disease. Next, please. So clearly, if this event is in any way a sign of things to come from climate change, it would have a major impact uh, for climate ad adaptation in Southeast Brazil. However, answering this question is not easy. A good and long observational record of precipitation and other important physical uh, variables is not available for this region. With regard to guidance from uh, climate models, rainfall variability in this region is not well represented in the main observed characteristics such as high percentile seasonality, spatial variability. Moreover, climate models largely remain unable to simulate realistically the phenomena that lead to rainfall variability over East and South America and their teleconnection. Uh, next, please. So this situation with limited long-term data record, a poor representation climate models of the relevant physical processes behind extreme events and ambiguous model predictions of the force the response to climate change is not specific to this region and its particular characteristics of countries in the global south. This is illustrated by the figure from the summary for policymakers of the IPCC AR6 which explicitly identify the regions uh, for which there is limited data and or literature on past change in gray, low agreement on type of change in hatching and or low confidence in, in a human contribution to those changes due to limited evidence in open staple. Uh, climate change science as it is its current practice and uh, I've shown tends to frame the scientific question as a singular definitive one. It does this by Fox on projections from climate models and emphasize where there is consensus among them, acknowledging uncertainty, but not really exploring it. So the focus on singular definitive problems is also expressed in still common practice across most uh, published climate, uh, climate change science to inter interpret the statistical significance in a dichotomous true-false manner. 
and avoided the articulation of multiple plausible hypotheses, which would uh, allow a plural condition framing of uncertainty. Next, please. So given the observed trends and the climate model's inability to adequately represent rainfall variability in so many regions of the global south, can we afford to wait until we have some uh, or more confident attribution statements to more uh, to provide decision makers with the information necessary to plan and adapt. Next, please. Next, thanks. With my climate risk, we are developing techniques such as story lines where we can work together with stakeholders, uh, policymakers, society from the beginning by choosing the available information from models and observation that are more appropriate to construct the relevant climate information. For instance, in the case of Eastern South America, with water supply uh, managers, we analyze ensemble members that project dry trends, while, while with uh, urban planners that are concerned about landslide and floods, we analyze ensemble members that project wetter trends. Instead of using the ensemble mean of all members, which gives us low agreement and low confidence. And this is our network of regional hubs. Uh, working uh, with these techniques and methodology uh, within um, my climate risk and in WCRP. Next slide, please. So we should uh, derive a conceptual framework from reality rather than deriving reality from a conceptual framework, uh, which is what we get from our, our focus on statistical significance rather than relevance uh, for decision making. The natural uh, tendency of a climate scientist to aggregate the data in a search for general explanation and not necessarily em em embed climate change science within a social context. In that sense, we should resist aggregation, and that is the beauty of storylines. Uh, ultimately, the bottom minute, up, uh, yes, Im imperative argues uh, for uh, looking at climate change science from a human perspective. Another point is that simplicity is important. It's rather more difficult to recapture directness and simplicity than to advance in the direction of ever more sophistication and complexity. And the last point is the need to empower local communities to make sense of their own situation, which can be addressed by developing simple tools that build trust and transparency. Much of climate change science is necessary to make science, but we argue that in order to make uh, climate information useful, for adaptation, it's also necessary to discover the beauty of smallness. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regina. And you kept a perfect timing as well. We have about five minutes for questions, either from in the room now. There's quite a few people in the room here in person or online. So perhaps I start with the room. Is, does anyone here have questions for uh, Regina, Bruce, or Helen? Otherwise, we'll go see if there's anyone online who wishes to ask a question. I can hand you the microphone so people can hear you. No questions? Is there any questions from anyone online? So Mike, I'm not seeing any in the chat. So if you are online and you have asked a question in the chat, um, my apologies, but I can't see anything. Uh, final opportunity, otherwise we will move <laughs> to the yeah. next uh, set of um, talks. Yeah, I so guess I'd just, um, yes, Go thanks, Mike. Sorry, I was just going to um, sort of reflect on the two talks that we heard. Um, and I wanted to thank Bruce and Regina for um, the approach that they've taken. It um, really characterises the transformation, if you like, or the evolution of where WCRP wants to go in addition to doing our, our fundamental climate science, but thinking about how we can build these bridges so that our climate science is meaningful and useful to society. So really important to start with that um, characterization of what society needs before we go into the science. But I think we'll go to the next set of talks and I'll just do a very brief introduction to this. Um, it's the sort of the, the logic here going from where we've been with Bruce and Regina is to now think about, well, what do we need from our models and our observations and our regional climate information? Um, and so we'll have Christian and then we'll have Daniela will talk about some of the exciting advances in observations modeling and regional climate information. So Christian, over to you. Thanks okay. so much, Helen. So we'll move to Christian. Christian, you have up to 12 minutes for your joint presentation. 
Thank you. So uh, my name is Christian Jacob. I am located in Melbourne, Australia, where I work for Monash University, and I'm the co-chair of one of the lighthouse activities of the WCIP called Digital Earth. And I have prepared this presentation with, together with one of the co-chairs of another WCIP activity, which is the Earth System Modeling and Observations Project, Suzanne Tegmeyer. So you hear uh, the collective thoughts of two people. And what I wanted to do is introduce you to the fact that our agreement to keep warming at a certain level um, of ideally 1.5 degrees, maybe two, um, has actually major implications for what climate science needs to do next. Because next slide, please. And the reason is that for us to construct um, yeah, for us to construct uh, a net zero economy, both nationally and internationally, there's new knowledge that we need that we currently don't have to, to the degree of confidence that we have. And that is, we need to know the future of our weather. And let me explain why I think that is. It's uh, indicated by those icons on the left. Um, let's take the renewable energy sector. Um, a carbon neutral and net zero economy requires us to make a lot of our electricity from the weather. So the weather isn't just that um, devastating flood and that massive heat wave uh, that we're expecting more frequently as our planet warms. It is also a day-to-day -day resource that we are all relying on and that we have to rely on increasingly as the planet warms because to achieve our net zero agenda requires us to exploit the weather at a scale we've never exploited it before. In addition to keep exploiting it at the scale, we've already been exploiting it, for instance, to create fresh water for people, to make to uh, grow food for people, and to have ecosystems that are actually functional. So there's a big challenge beyond knowing the uh, development of the global mean temperature, beyond knowing continental scale change, we really now, and beyond knowing extremes, which we have done major progress on, uh, made major progress on over the last decades, we now need to know the future of the day-to-day -day weather, how it interacts with the variability of our climate, and how it will change as our climate is changing. That actually, next slide please, has major implications for our tools. Our current tools are actually not quite up to the task. And we have to do some major, you know, create some major new science initiatives to actually meet that challenge. Why are our tools not up to the task? Well, on the left, you see on the top, the current depiction of my continent, Australia, um, in a current global climate model. And at the bottom, you see what it might really look like at a resolution of about five kilometers. And you can see there's some major differences. So really, the resolution we are able to use in our current global climate modeling efforts is way too coarse to represent the processes that are relevant to weather scales. And so that's um, a challenge. And I'll show you more in a second. And on the right, you see the consequence of that. And the consequence of that is that some of the errors we have in our climate models are of the same size, especially for rainfall, are of the same size as uh, the um, pro projected signal at two degrees warming. So we really need to work very hard to improve our tools for, predict for predicting the climate to meet this demand of actually knowing how the weather is gonna change. Uh, next slide, please. And we have the capability to do it, um, but we have a long way to go before it works at the level that we as scientists would be satisfied with. And on the left, you see some examples of where we have the capability to do it. Um, these are all computer model generated images, and some of them are movies, which I uh, just took stills from. And on the top left, you see computer modeled thunderstorms. Um, the model that's modeling them has a grid spacing of horizontal box size uh, of about one kilometer. Current climate models um, are more like 100 kilometers. We see the Gulf Stream, in the bottom left, modeled at one kilometer. And it's not just beautiful, it's actually also very scientifically exciting. And we see sea ice at one kilometer, and you can actually see the Arctic there and sea ice at a particular time, and you can see the cracks and the leads and the ridges um, that are forming in the sea ice. 
Um, what's challenging is putting all this together to make a global climate model, but some, some of us are trying, and on the right is a result of just a few days of simulation with such global models. And what's fascinating about this picture is there's in this picture, there are 10 representations of the clouds on Earth from models, and one is a satellite image picture taken from a satellite. And I'd like to challenge you to identify which of those is the satellite and which of those are the models. So there's a huge potential to significantly improve our game. So we need to improve our modeling approaches. Next slide, please. But there's another challenge, and that is to observe weather scales is actually quite hard. And we have observing systems that do it, but they usually operate on weather time scales as well. And the data isn't actually stored for very long. So there's weather scale information, but not on climate time scales. And then we have data on climate time scales that is usually not adequate to look at weather processes. And so we really have a challenge on our hand to take our observation systems to the next step. And here's an atmospheric observation system on the left, and you can see how um, there's an interconnect between surface-based observations, satellite-based observations, and anything in between. And on the right, you see the observing a depiction of the observing system for the ocean, also very complex system with many, many ingredients. And the challenge is now to really combine the fine scales that the weather knowledge requires with the long time scales that climate knowledge requires. And one way of doing this, oh no, I, next slide, before I get to a, a way of doing this, I, I just wanted to highlight two challenges to make my observing system comment a little bit more hands-on. One challenge is wind. We need to know a lot about wind and we need to know a lot about the future of wind, but wind is one of the hardest things to observe. We have sort of wind masts, I show you a photograph of one, but the moment that tree that you see in the background keeps growing, uh, it changes the measurement of the wind. So it's very difficult to extract long-term climate information from these observations with wind masts. It's one of the hardest quantities to observe, yet it's one of the most important quantities for our future because a lot of our energy, a lot of our electricity around the world will be generated from wind. Um, we also have satellites, but it's extremely difficult to observe wind from satellites. And all we can do is these little slices through our atmosphere that you see from one of the ESA satellites that is actually just a research satellite. It's not a weather satellite that provides continuous products. Rainfall is an equally big challenge, actually. Observing rainfall is a very, very difficult task, right? So the traditional method is a bucket which we call a rain gauge. You see, it's, it's a fancy bucket, um, but it's still a bucket. And we call them rain gauges. And that's our bread and butter observations. But as you will see, they are very localized. Um, and we have observations for very long periods of time, but very localized, so they don't give a full picture of the weather. Then we have radars that most of you use to find out whether it's gonna rain in two hours, wherever you are, wherever you go. And they are very nice and very comprehensive, but they are not direct measurements of rainfall. And we usually have them for very short periods of time. And in between sit satellites from which we can also deduce uh, rainfall. And we've had those since about the 1980s, uh, mid 1980s, early 1990s, and reliably probably only from the mid 1990s. So there's a very tough challenge to even just know what rainfall on earth is like at any given time, um, integrated over the, weather, the many weather systems we see on the Earth. Next uh, slide, please. So one of the techniques we use and intend to use in the future is we need to merge the observed information with, with the information we get from the models. That works better, the better the models are. So there's a link to building better models and improving the modeling. Um, and the technique we use is data assimilation. So we have a a large program now in the WCRP to think about how we can do this for climate. This is a, an activity that's very uh, frequently undertaken in weather forecasting. In fact, it have, it's, it's undertaken all the time. But adapting this to climate time scales is actually another one of those large challenges. All right, so how do we bring it all together? Next slide. There's of course one more component which you've heard from Bruce and Regina about, and that is uh, there's the human component. Actually, I claim very few of us really wanna know about rainfall and really wanna know about wind. 
We as climate scientists obviously do, but you as users of climate information, you want to know how much wind power, how, how much electricity can I make from wind and where. You want to know, will this um, catchment flood, what will the stream flow be for this river? These are the questions that we really have and how might that change as our climate is changing? So really the additional component, even in this rather technical area of, of modeling, is that we also want to integrate decision-making tools directly into the workflow. And we actually have to do that because our traditional way of operating that we run our climate models, we store their output, we provide that to people who have models that think of that model crops, that model wind power, um, that model stream flow, that paradigm will no longer work once we have climate models that run at a grid spacing of about a kilometer. And the reason it's not going to work is the volume of data is just too big. So really, we need to bring together three general areas. The area that I described is the sort of climate science data simulation modeling um, together with the digital revolution, the high performance computing, data handling systems, the, 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 the internet of things, the way we observe the world. You know, we observe the world more through our mobile yeah, more, our mobile phones than anything else. And the third component is the applications. And to do this, the um, WCRP has two programs, and that's the next and final slide that I just wanted to alert you to. Um, and one is the so-called Earth System Modeling Ob and Observations Core Project, which is a project that really builds the underpinning tools for what I've been talking about. And then leading the charge in this revolution of climate modeling and observations is the Digital Earth Lighthouse activity. Um, and both of, both of them together actually put WCLP in a, in a great place to try and lead this next revolution of the way we do climate modeling. And if you wanna find out more about it, please contact me, contact Suzanne, contact Helen, Mike, any of us, and we'll give you more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. You also kept the perfect timing. Um, we'll hand over to uh, Daniela now. Uh, Daniela, you can introduce yourself and you have eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello from Hamburg. My name is Daniela Jakob. I'm uh, based in Hamburg in Germany. And I would like to share some views from the Cordex community, which I have pulled together with uh, Silvina Solmon, who is a co-chair of the WCRP Cordex activity and Irene Lake from the IPO, Cordex IPO. Cordex is a regional initiative, which is providing worldwide information for risk assessments and adaptation options. Next slide, please. Codex has been developed about uh, 10, 15 years ago in order to carry out organized uh, experiments to bridge the gap between the glo global climate models, as you see here, the, uh, the ball, the upper ball on the left side, to the local needs. And the Codex initiative has utilized limited area modeling in an organized, coordinated way for all continents of the world to provide information on regional and local scale. Cordex is carried out with a lot of uh, modeling studies with many, many contributors, and it's meant to act as a platform. Next slide, please. A platform in which the, um, the global collaboration is connected by local and regional information by local and regional expertise to take into account not only the local and regional climate phenomena, weather phenomena, which are impacting local and regional uh, societies and ecosystems, but also to uh, learn from the expertise of the local experts. We heard in the first talks about the core design, the core collection, the core development of information and Cordex as a modeling effort has already worked in this core design and core development frame since many years to provide um, state of the art and uh, reliable information which is fit for the purpose, which is designed with the local experts in a way that it is usable and useful to carry out local and regional risk assessment, vulnerability studies, but also to support adaptation 
to climate change. So Cortex acts as a platform, as a facilitator for coordination and cooperation to transfer the knowledge which has been gained, for example, in an, in an um, assessment about adaptation options and its usefulness and its impact uh, so that it can be transferred from one continent to the other, from one context to another context. It is closely connected to other WCRP initiatives, and there are some platforms which provide data like climateinformation.org, which I think is important. Codex efforts go into assessments, for example, the two I've mentioned here on climate in different regions. Next slide, please. Today, I would like to give you a few uh, ideas about uh, the diversity in which contexts for which sectors and cross-sectoral activities, the Cortex data can be used. Here from uh, Vietnam, there is an integrated water management and urban development study, where you see that in this study, in, in working out the course through inception to the pilot investment for the demonstration, there is a dedicated slot where information is needed on how, for example, uh, weather and climate conditions are changing and how they are, um, how uh, strongly they can impact the, uh, the region and uh, serve as the base for planning. Next slide, please. Usually, the, as an example here, the uh, data information is developed in, on a scientific basis, as I said, in a coordinated way to minimize uncertainty, but also to to get a, a reliable information about the possible spread of future climatic changes. And it is uh, assessed, evaluated, and uh, quality controlled before the data goes into applications. Next slide, please. When it goes into application, it goes into application of very different um, kinds. I will not talk today about the scientific side to explore the regional and local changes of weather phenomena and climates, but I would like to give you a few ideas in which relationship the data can be useful. For example, if you're interested in spreading of diseases and how this spreading of diseases is influenced by climate change. And uh, there's a very interesting study here on the impact of future climate change on malaria in West Africa. But of course, it also plays an important role on food production and, uh, and uh, food reliability. So for example, if you look at the impact of potential warming of 1.5, two or three degrees on the crop suitability and planting season over West Africa or in other re re regions of the world, it is important to get information about what Christian just said, um, precipitation, for example, but also wind and, and uh, temperature and others. Next slide, please. There are joint studies which are carried out within those um, continental cortex groups, I would say. If you go to the WCRP cortex website, you will find the domains in which the cortex activities are carried out. They are spread over all continents and they are carried out in a coordinated way, as I said before. So here as an information from Europe, as, as, a, uh, um, as an example, you can look at the heat stress in Europe and its impact. So usually a large number of global climate models and regionally downscaled information is used as the databases behind those studies. And here you see a study where uh, 84 GCM RCM uh, simulations have been used and uh, European stations have been assessed. So what you can do with the data is you can look at the reliability of the simulations first in a way that you compare against observations. And then you can go with this information into the future and follow climate simulations, climate scenarios with a lot of mitigation or with no mitigation to see how would the One heat minute, stress yeah. in Europe change, for example. And then you can connect this with the economic impact by country. Next slide, please. You can also go, and that's what climate services are doing in many regions of the world, and Cordex is very closely cooperating with many climate services. You can 
you can develop from the global to the local the information which is needed in the dedicated context, as I mentioned with a few examples. And this all is disseminated in, on many platforms which are quality controlled and which serve the use for the Cordix data in climate risk assessment and vulnerability studies. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you very much, Daniela. Again, kept to perfect timing. We can now go to um, see their questions from the floor here or online. If there's not, I have one for Christian, but uh, I'll open it to the floor first. If there's anyone here who has a question, there is. Hang on whilst I move the, uh, the mic. And just while you're walking to the audience, Mike, um, so far there's none online. So we'll, you've got the floor there. Thank you, thank you very much for those uh, very, uh, very great uh, presentation. My name is Clément Albergel. I am with the European Space Agency Climate Office. And I have a, a question for Christian. When you, you mentioned uh, going to a higher uh, scale, one kilometer uh, resolution in your, in your system, and as you have illustrated, it brings more complexity because there are many small scale processes that you will need to account for that were simply aggregated uh, previously. So it's not only about computing uh, power, it's also about extra uh, processes. And when you talk about land atmosphere coupling, you've mentioned wind, you've mentioned uh, precipitation, but we also have the land component that for a while has been a, a lower limit. Now we have access to high resolution uh, soil moisture, vegetation, and, each, and this the um, dynamic uh, temporal and spatial resolution of those uh, parameters surely have a strong impact, for example, on the convective precipitation. What are your main, your main uh, plan when it comes to land surface processes? Yeah, that's an excellent question actually. And, and it's very true. So for the atmosphere and for the ocean, the motivation to go to a few kilometers or ultimately one kilometer type resolution is the problem gets easier because certain processes that we uh, had to, what we call parameterize in these global models, we can now, the model actually naturally resolves. Thunderstorms being the prime example, ocean eddies being another one, cracks in the sea ice, ridges in the sea ice being another one. The one sphere where this is not true is the land surface. The land surface actually will get more complex because some of the processes that aggregated up very nicely so we could ignore them are no longer ignorable. Slope effects, groundwater, transport of water um, under the ground that then comes back into soil moisture somewhere else. Processes like that. So the WCRP has a very strong land surface community um, in one of its projects. And we have started the process of engaging with them because we need their help. And luckily, what Daniela told you, there's also regional modeling efforts that have already reached these kind of resolutions. And there's a growing experience how to treat the land surface well in those regional models. There's still a long way to go even there. But it's really a new challenge for the land surface modeling community as well. But there's some experience from the regional side. So I can't answer precisely what we will do in detail because I'm not a land surface modeler, but I can promise you there is the best and brightest land surface modelers on this planet are engaged in the process. Thank you, Christian. And for the question, any other questions from the floor here or online? So Mike, if there aren't any questions from the floor there, I know you've got one for Christian. There are none online. Um, I'd just like to make a quick sort of follow up to that really good question and Christian's really good answer. Um, two parts to my comment. The first is that not only do we have good land surface modeling capability in our WCRP community of scientists and researchers, but we work closely with other programs outside WCRP as well to bring in like biology, uh, plant physiology and so forth. But the second part of my comment is, yeah, Christian's right. Um, it does, going to a higher resolution makes some aspects of the land surface and the land atmosphere coupling quite more complicated. But I just wanna remind us all, that actually makes it harder, but that's the really important thing, because guess what, where people are, <laughs> whose health and, and ecosystems as well, it's at those finer scales. So the, there's a real scientific and impact imperative to get that, that um, those processes represented as well as we can, um, because actually some of the applications that we need to address are at those scales. I'll stop, that's just a comment, because Daniela's got her hand up, Daniela. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, triggered by, by your answers and the question, uh, I just want to say that, of course, we are also um, working towards the uh, integration of mitigation and adaptation options which are changing the land surface. So different land management uh, options, which, uh, for example, are um, strengthening, strengthening the CO2 uptake of soil, also um, activities which are around uh, re-wettening of peatlands are very important for not only mitigation, uh, but they, uh, they are also important for local climate. And I think that is important to, uh, at the same time, while we are working on the scientific coupling and the, the higher resolution uh, modeling, that we bring in the uh, possibilities to work with possible adaptation and mitigation options from the global to the local scale, and to look into their feedbacks, into their impacts on the region and uh, before we take a decision on the adaptation option. So there's a long way to go, but I think it's extremely important and it is extremely urgent. Thank you, Daniela. That's a very important point. How are we going for time, Mike? Have we got any more questions from we've the floor about, there? We've got about a minute left. We do have another okay. question here. So I think that'll probably be the last question. Let me just yep, hand thanks. over. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Richard Jones from the Met Office Hadley Centre, uh, and I'm just wanting to follow up on the question from Clement uh, and the response from, from Christian. Um, I'm just wondering whether there is sufficient integration or um, use of regional climate models in terms of uh, understanding the system and going to very high resolutions and bringing in um, integrating observations with these issues around land surface modeling within the the ESMO framework because ESMO seems to be very focused on um, global couple modeling but it's it's very clear that the high resolution regional models have a very good role to play um, in the development of the very high resolution for for these issues around the land surface I'm just wondering whether any of the, the panelists can can um, comment on the level of integration between the cordex activities and the ESMO activities and whether we need to do more in that space. Okay, so I will comment because we've just had a workshop. Um, and, and so the, the digital lighthouse activity is actually an activity that understands itself as a model development activity for kilometer scale modeling. And it does not distinguish between global and regional. And it's, a, it's, it's our goal to have actually what we call a global regional alliance for model development for the development of the future generation of models that actually draws on the experience that you mentioned. Um, I think we would all put the hand on our heart and say we could have done better over the past decade. Um, and so we are committed to doing better over the next decade. And in fact, this there's a since since you probably read these things, Richard, uh, there is a, a WCRP report will come out about this workshop where this is actually quite an important topic as to how to build this global regional modeling alliance, which we are committed to doing, because it makes a whole lot of sense when you go to these resolutions, right? So yes, watch this space. Thank you very much, Christian. I think we should um, move on. Thanks very much for the panelists so far and for the questions we've had. Any final yep. comments, Helen? Otherwise, I think we should move on. No, nothing from me. I think we'll go to the next, um, what I call session, which is actually, it's a nice segue because we're now going into the impacts and attribution and we'll have four talks. So I'm going to hand straight over to Gabby. Can we have the Gabby's first title slide up, please? Hopefully it's on its way. Yes. Here it is. Thank you. We good go. morning or good whatever time it is in your place. Um, so I'm going to talk about attribution and prediction, uh, focusing particularly on, on heat in my short slot. And um, these, um, some of the results here have been uh, contributed by my colleague Andrew Shure in Edinburgh, and it has been co-developed with um, Rowan Sutton, who chairs the Explaining and Predicting Earth System um, um, Science um, Lighthouse, and I'm um, co-chairing the Lighthouse on Safe Landing Climates. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this is a, um, a picture from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently released report on causes of climate change. 
and um, shows um, on the left hand side of the slide the observed warming with uncertainties um, of just a bit above one degree um, in comparison to what um, we estimate to be the contribution by um, uh, various trace gases and, and external forces um, from um, from, the from how they perturb the radiative budget of the planet on the right side of the slide and from attributing um, changes and um, causes to the observed change in the middle. Um, this, um, this middle para, um, panel basically is derived from um, taking the um, shape in space and time of the um, change that we expect from the models, but looking at observations for the magnitude of the change. And we find that um, the total human influence is um, um, very much very similar to what um, the observed change is with um, some uncertainty so that the observed warming has been um, pretty much caused by anthropogenic influences and then we can um, to some extent disentangle um, the role of greenhouse gases which is um, similar or, or more than the observed warming um, compared to the contribution by aerosols which um, is um, still quite uncertain even in large-scale models um, and with a small contribution by um, by other con uh, contributors such as solar and volcanic drivers and internal variability. Um, we recognize though that internal variability while not being a big factor on very long time scales is an important factor on intermediate and shorter time scales and is something we need to account for when going forward. Um, um, which I'm going to do on my last slide, but the next slide um, looks at this uh, a similar analysis over the region of Egypt. Um, looking at the observed um, um, evolution of Egyptian of, of mean temperatures over Egypt um, in black. This is evaluated from, um, from an analysis data set of, um, um, called BEST, but is re reaffirmed by the four longer stations. And this is compared to the um, model simulation from the CIMIP um, class for um, all forcings combined in red. And you can see that the um, observed and the model simulated change is quite similar. And if, if we do an attribution analysis, um, we can disentangle the role of greenhouse gases and aerosols combined against that from natural forcings. Um, in other words, um, the observed change is um, very similar to what we expect from the models with um, very small uncertainties um, with some contribution by natural forcings, which in this case is particularly volcanic forcing. And you can clearly see that the, um, the, the Egyptian temperature has, uh, has long left um, the range of, um, of temperatures expected from natural forcings only. And the variability that we observe um, is similar to what is simulated by um, the models. So even over um, even with a relatively coarse model, you can see that the mean temperature anomalies um, is are similar to what the single uh, class model simulates. Next slide, please. If we look at how um, what this means for um, climate change um, in temperature over um, the seasonal cycle, um, you can see the seasonal cycle um, at um, um, in at a change of one, one and a half, two, three, and and, and four degrees relative um, um, relative to the present, and you can see that there's an expectation of an increased um, warming um, red, um, set relative to pre-industrial, and you can see that there's an increased um, warming, particularly in the hottest months of the year, um, in simulated by the models with um, relatively small uncertainty um, that is exceeds um, the um, global mean temperature change and um, that they're um, allocated to. So you get, um, for example much more than four degrees of warming um, in, in summer over Egypt. So um, increase, so this um, indicates there's an increasing risk from heat, um, which um, to be um, eva evaluated in detail, we've just seen in the previous slides, um, needs a lot more information, but um, um, the long-term conditions and, and the probability of um, intense heat waves across the planet vary with climate variability um, and, um, also, heat um, intense heat is a is a very um, a severe long um, in, impact with um, substantial um, consequences, as we have seen with some recent events, um, where um, downstream consequences can be um, fires. Um, um, it exacerbates drought, and so heat, um, fire, and drought across the planet are a, a very severe hazard that also feeds back on the climate and on our ability to mitigate, for example. Um, through um, very substantial carbon emissions from large fires. Um, and so we need to be in a better position to um, 
to uh, predict changes in intense heat and um, risk from intense heat from on all time scales from the near decade to the end of the century. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, and therefore, the um, two of the lighthouse activities, um, if APESC um, um, has a working group on assessment of current and future hazards, including heat, um, integrating attribution with prediction, and safe landing climates um, has um, an activity on large scale heat extremes that challenge adaptation, both on land and marine time scales. And so both of our um, lighthouses consider compound events and their impact on sustainable development goals. Um, and um, um, on two different timescales, and we are um, developing close collaboration on, um, on better assessing this very severe hazard um, um, that could endanger our ability to mitigate climate change if um, by a large release of carbon. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Gabby. And again, keeping to time excellently. Uh, we're now moving across to uh, Wendy Broadgates, and you have around eight minutes, Wendy. Thank you, Mike. Switch it off. Sorry, it's on, right? You can hear me. Yep. I'm Wendy Broadgate. I'm the Global Hub Director of Future Earth, based in Stockholm, and I'm also the Executive Director of the Earth Commission. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about is the framework of the Earth Commission, um, which is an assessment um, of Earth system boundaries and transformations for a safe and just planet. Um, it's, a, it's a group, a high level commission and five working groups, about 60 experts involved, and it's co chaired by Jayita Gupta, uh, Professor Kinda He, and Johan Rockström. Um, it's hosted by Future Earth, but it's also part of the Global Commons Alliance, which is where we have our um, close connection with our societal partners. The assessment is designed to underpin science-based targets beyond climate. So that's science-based targets for other Earth systems, such as water, biodiversity, land, and so on. And, and therefore has a, a very close connection with um, offering tools for decision makers in cities and businesses and then in, company, in countries. Next slide, please. So we're all aware of, that we are rapidly approaching tipping points in the Earth system. Um, those tipping points, there's increasing evidence that those tipping points interact, and we need much deeper studies to understand these. Next, please. Um, this map is um, from the Timothy Lenton paper from a few years ago, but I'd like to talk about the very recent paper by David Armstrong Mackay that came out about a month ago um, that's part of the Earth Commission work. Next, please. So the recent work um, has shown that as um, this is, this is uh, a map of tipping points and the risks of triggering those tipping points at different temperatures. And as you can see, the first five bars of this graph show that at 1.5 degrees, we're already at risk of tipping five tipping points in the Earth system. Those are the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, tropical coral reefs, uh, permafrost thaw, and the Barents Sea ice. Um, so those risks are already um, present, uh, that it's, it's um, likely that we chip those tipping points at 1.5 degrees, and this is very serious. Next slide, please. So the tipping point analysis is central to the Earth Commission work. Um, our objectives are to provide a, a synthesis of the quantitative boundary conditions for biophysical processes and systems that regulate the stability and resilience of the Earth system, and also to assess knowledge about levers of transformation. Our ultimate goal is to provide safe and just Earth system boundaries for a stable and resilient planet. Next, please. So those boundaries are in the following areas, climate, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, biospheric integrity, area of natural land, surface water, groundwater, and air pollution. Um, and each of those domains, we're assessing the, the safe boundary, but also doing analysis of what is, just, uh, what is a just boundary for those areas of the Earth system. Next, please. Um, this is a map from the Armstrong-Mackay paper showing the tipping points 
with a color code um, about the risk of tipping at different temperatures. Um, so you can see the red dots are the five that I mentioned earlier. But I, I want to use this opportunity to say that um, we are setting up a tipping points model into comparison project that is similar to the CMIP of the IPCC because the uh, we, we need the multiple models of uh, tipping points and a comparison within them to understand how tipping points interact, to understand the uncertainties within tipping points. And this major project is a collaboration with WCRP, with AIMS, um, and is will be um, built up over the coming years. But that's a central tool to our um, assessment, which will be multi-year assessment. We've produced, uh, we'll be producing a, a first assessment early next year. Um, those papers are in peer review right now. Um, and then we intend through the, the tip MIP to continue to refine the analysis. Next, please. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the just element of these earth system boundaries. Um, so we have a number of social scientists in the group and they've the, the framework for um, just earth system boundaries has two aspects. Uh, minimum access levels, so access for um, a dignified life for all to these um, earth system um, services, these earth system, um, these um, um, global commons. It has aspects around interspecies, intergenerational and intragenerational justice. And the earth system boundaries are also designed to minimize significant harm to people. Um, so ultimately, we then um, combine the safe boundaries with a just boundary to create a corridor, a safe and just corridor for people and planet. Next, please. Um, so as I said, we have our safe ceiling, our boundary defined by the biophysical stability of the planet. Next. Um, we do a justice analysis for what, um, what it what is no significant to people, no significant harm to people for um, that global commons. If that, if um, at the safe level for the biophysical boundary, if there's significant harm to people, we need to make that boundary more stringent. So the just boundary is often, but not always more stringent than the safe. Next. And then we have the floor of the corridor defined by minimum access for a dignified life. Next. So there we have the, um, the stringent earth system boundary um, and ceiling and the access floor next and a safe and just corridor. And if the access floor exceeds the, um, the ceiling of the, the safe ceiling, we don't actually have a corridor. And in that case, in order for um, development to happen, for everybody to have access to our global commons, we need significant transformation to bring us to bring that access floor down. So we need to reduce overconsumption cons considerably, particularly in the, in the um, rich uh, parts of the world. Next, please. So as I said, the global, the global Commons Alliance is the framework within which the Earth Commission sits as the scientific component. Um, the analysis is designed to underpin the setting of science-based targets for businesses, cities, and nations. And the science-based targets network is a network of NGOs specifically designed to use this analysis to help companies to set targets, um, similar to the Science-Based Targets Initiative for Climate. But this is for the other areas of the system. And then there are other components of the Alliance that are working on um, mobilizing um, society around this, uh, having accountability around these targets, and also mobilizing and measuring system change. Next, please. And finally, I want to just make a shameless plug for um, a report that we are bringing out tomorrow, the 10 New Insights in Climate Science. This is a collaboration between Future Earth, uh, WCRP, and the Earth League, and we produce it every year, and there's a press conference at um, tomorrow morning at 9. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Wendy, and uh, I'll eat my words, you kept perfectly to time. Um, so we'll now hand over to uh, Junyi, and you have six or seven minutes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Junyi Lee at Busan National University, Republic of Korea, and also I have served as 
coordinating lead author of AR6 Working Group 1, Chapter 4 on Global Climate Change. Uh, today, I'd like to briefly introduce some, uh, some part of advances in developing physical climate information for decision making assessed in the Working Group 1 contribution to uh, IPCC 6 assessment cycle AR6. Next, please. Uh, as we heard from previous talks, there have been great advances in developing climate information uh, for decision making, particularly in the near term and at the regional scale. And those, uh, those advances are big bone of IPCC assessment. And also the current activities will be really important for the next cycle of IPCC assessment, I believe. Uh, and climate change is a global phenomenon, but its manifestation and consequences are different in different regions. Thus, the climate information uh, should be considered in the regional or local level for their risk assessment uh, and impact studies. And for the first time, working group, uh, ARC Working Group 1 provides a detailed information of regional climate changes uh, with a focus on more uh, regional detail information for risk assessment, adaptation, and other decision making. And also you can uh, figure out from the structure of the report, and you can see that one third of the report are dedicated to the regional information from the chapter 10, which link global climate change to regional climate change. And we have extreme chapter 12 and uh, regional climate information chapter 12 and also very nice atlas chapter. The physical and biochemical climate science information with a particular emphasis on regional climate change assessed in working group one report are relevant for mitigation, adaptation and risk assessment in the context of complex and evolving policy settings, including the Paris Agreement, the Global Static, the Sendai Framework, and the Sustained Development Global Framework. Next, please. And next, please. Uh -huh. And uh, there is some very complicated schematics you can see here, but this figure um, emphasizes the importance of uh, interaction and co-production of climate information between scientists and also end users and decision makings. And the figure is from chapter 10. And I believe uh, chapter 10 is a very important chapter to link global climate change to regional climate change and also provide uh, some uh, framework, a conceptual framework to develop regional climate changes. And there are two important processes. Uh, one is the distillation of regional climate information from multiple lines of evidence. And this uh, include multiple observational data set, ensembles of different model types, process understanding, expert judgment, and also include uh, indigenous knowledge. And those important elements of distillation include attribution studies, the characterization of possible outcomes associated with the internal variability, and a comprehensive assessment of observational model and forcing uncertainties and possible contradictions using different analysis methods. So actually those are kind of same line you have heard from previous talks uh, in many activities of the WCRP. Next, please. And the other important process is the uh, distillation of regional climate information, taking the user context into account. So the collaboration, communication with the users are very important. And also taking the values of the relevant actors into account when co-producing climate information and translating this information into the broader user context actually improves the usefulness and fitness and uptake of this information. Next, please. Uh, then also in the uh, working group report, we try to better provide information of a potential relevance to the 2023 global static, uh, which include remaining cumulative carbon emissions budget for a range of global warming levels, 
effects of long-lived and short-lived climate forces, observed climate changes and their attribution to human forcing, projected long-term warming levels and projected changes in sea level and climate extremes under different scenarios, and near-term climate information for adaptation and mitigation options. So if you see the SPM of Working Group 1 report, uh, one section, section C, uh, was devoted to uh, uh, providing those information. Next slide. Uh, and this is my uh, final slide, and I'd like to conclude this uh, short talk with uh, this slide. And this is some of uh, key, key scientific questions to inform near-term adaptation and mitigation options and also global start tests. And those are, I think, very important questions. And across the report, we try to assess uh, and answer, address those questions, but uh, many of those questions are outstanding. And also many of the questions are very relevant for the recent WCRP activities. So uh, let me just um, point out a few questions. What are projected key climate indices under different emission scenario in the near term? So where internal variability play a very important role? Okay, so this is almost done. And also I'd like to uh, emphasize that there may be some near term surprises which may result in particular adaptation challenges, uh, such as large volcanic eruptions, similar to the uh, one, uh, 1992 Pinatubo eruption, and also other uh, internal variability like the triple La Nina event occurred in recent years. So those are very important information we need to better understand and better address. Okay, I'd like to stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Junyi. And now, uh, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Sonia, who's online. So over to you, Sonia. I think I'll, you have about seven minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So I speak about past and projected changes in weather and climate extreme, especially related to the assessment we had in the latest IPCC report. I was coordinating the chapter on weather and climate extreme risk to Big Zang for Environment uh, Canada. And I was also involved in the 1.5 report. Next slide, please. Uh, so I think we realize that we are in a climate crisis. If we are just looking at recent weather and climate extremes, uh, such as those included on this slide, uh, we have had a, a range of major weather extremes, which also were very impactful, such as the heat wave in Canada last year, uh, in which uh, temperatures of more than 49.5 degrees were reached. There was also flooding in Germany with many deaths associated to it. This summer, we had a major drought and heat wave in Europe. Again, there many people died of the heat and there were major impacts of the drought. And finally, of course, uh, flooding in Pakistan, just as one first example with one third of the country, which was covered uh, by water. Um, next. So all of these events were made more probable due to human-induced climate change. From the knowledge we have now, from the literature, we see that these type of events are more probable now, and they will become even more likely with increasing global warming and also more intense. Next slide. So regarding observed change in weather and climate extremes, uh, an important point from our chapter, and it was the first time that there was a full chapter on climate extremes within the IPCC assessment, is that the evidence of observed change in extremes has strengthened. We have much more evidence on those uh, changes, not only because we have more science and more, more papers, but also because there have been more events that occurred in the meantime. We also have from the literature evidence that some recent hot extreme events would have been extremely unlikely to occur without human influence on the climate system. So we are starting to see some events that we would never have expected without human influence. Regarding the extreme events that were considered within uh, our chapter, there was really a range of events, all of which are affected in some way by human induced climate change. For instance, temperature extremes, heavy precipitation, floods, droughts, storms, tropical cyclones, in particular compound events. A very important conclusion is that we are finding that human induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the world. Next slide, please. 
So regarding these points, this is illustrated in those maps. So you see here for each of the different regions of the world where we are already seeing some increase in hot extremes, extreme rainfall or droughts. And clearly we see that every region is affected in some way. So basically no region is spared. And I think this is an essential message because of course there are some hotspots of change, but really nobody uh, is spared in some way. Next slide. Regarding the project changes, so we see already now we are strongly affected by climate change and there are already some major changes in extreme, but obviously with increasing global warming, this change will be further amplified. So we have an increase in the frequency and intensity of several climate extremes. For instance, hot extremes, marine heat waves, heavy precipitation, agricultural and ecological droughts in some regions, and also the proportion of intense tropical cyclones. And a really important point, I think now for the COP27, is that we already have much higher risk at two degrees compared to 1.5 degrees, including some irreversible impacts. And I think we need to be aware of this. It is worth it to limit global warming as close as possible to 1.5 degrees, because as we would go into massive changes, further changes. Next slide, please. I just want to illustrate this for the hot extremes. We are looking at an event that would have happened only once every 10 years in a climate without human influence. Such an event on average on land is happening three times every 10 years. So again, this is illustrating that climate change is already happening now. We are already suffering the consequences of human-induced climate change. Next. At 1.5 degrees, such events would happen four times every 10 years. Next. At two degrees, it will happen six times every 10 years. This means that the majority of summers would be extreme. You see already at two degrees, really a massive change. Next. At four degrees, it will happen nine times every 10 years. So basically, almost all summers would be affected. Next slide, please. So to conclude, it is worth limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees to avoid further increases in extreme events. But of course, time is running out. That's why the decision at the COP27 are essential. Next. And I want to finish with those words from IPCC, which already uh, came from the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree. Every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Sonia, again, for keeping to time. In fact, every speaker kept to time, which is excellent. So we do have time for questions now. So first of all, if there's anything from the uh, in the hall here. If anyone wishes to ask a question, I will hand on the mic. We do already have a question. Just introduce yourself. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Pipen Prakash and I'm from Fiji. So I work for the National Med Service in Fiji. My question is uh, with reference to attribution of extreme precipitation. Uh, I know it's quite difficult, especially in the tropical regions. I just want to understand what's the latest on attribution of uh, uh, extreme precipitation uh, to climate change, uh, especially in the tropical regions. Yeah, so I can answer this point. Um, in uh, our chapter, basically, on global scale, we find that heavy precipitation is becoming more intense with increasing global warming. So we have evidence that uh, those events are intensifying with increasing global warming. And they have already and intensified. Sorry, Sonia. Um, I just wanted to invite Gabby to make a comment as well, if she wishes. OK, yeah, no, no, Sonia has them. I agree um, totally with Sonia. Um, the, the difficulty with precipitation is that individual precipitation events um, are very difficult to attribute because there are um, there are sampling issues. There's, um, there, are, for example, the very extreme boulder flood a few years ago um, was um, difficult to attribute because it was a, a rare, um, a rare and very local phenomenon. So this emphasizes the challenges that our first, um, particularly our first set of speakers have emphasized on regional change. But on large scales, um, the heavy precipitation on average is increasing. Um, um, and increasing in a similar way as um, climate models have um, predicted. So under under the same con under the same weather conditions in a warmer atmosphere, you get more heavy rainfall in a warmer and moister atmosphere. Thanks, Gabby. Any more questions from the floor there, Mike? Any more questions from the floor here or online? 
sorry, what was that last comment? I missed that. If there isn't, I'll uh, quickly ask my my um, yep. question to Christian, who, and thanks Christian for staying up. I know it's getting very late for you. Uh, one thing going back to the Digital Earths concept, there has been talked about these regional digital Earths, so a digital Earth of Europe or North America or whatever. And there seems to be, obviously, there's a capability in, in these countries to have a regional a regional digital earth of those areas, but are there plans you're aware of, for example, a regional, a digital twin of West Africa or Southeast Asia? So I, I have not heard of any concrete plans. The concept of digital earth is relatively young. It was first developed for global systems, but since then the idea has arisen that one could envisage having regional um, digital earth, why not, um, in the sense that you create a data set from these data assimilation methods that describes the state of the system, not just the natural systems, but including human systems, say, over a continent. I am in Australia, so say for the Australian continent. And um, it actually links very nicely to what happens in weather prediction already. So one of the other bridges that we are hoping to build over the next two or three years is a, a very close collaboration between the weather and climate community in this space. And, you know, I think Daniela may even know a little bit more of early attempts on this, but this sort of, the concept is very young, I will say, but it is gaining traction and it is really down to governments um, to actually buy into it both on the global scale, where my personal view is the best implementation we could imagine. And I should say that at a COP meeting is an international center that really involves many, many countries building this global digital earth system together, rather than having individual countries compete with limited resources, both intellectual and computational. Um, and then for the regional systems, they are somewhat cheaper because they don't have to cover the whole globe. A consort individual countries or consortia of countries could could come together to build systems in their regions specifically to look at aspects of not just climate change but environmental um, prediction and environmental change overall so it's actually quite an attractive concept i think it just needs time to grow so daniela has her hand up and i think i don't see any other hands up so daniela let's go to you yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in uh, in Europe, there is an uh, activity ongoing called Destination Earth, and uh, that is closely related to this digital Earth uh, idea, I would say, um, in which we are currently discussing the different options. And I fully agree to uh, what Christian just said, that uh, if you look at a fully systemic view of the, the Earth system than the very high resolution, fully stretched interactive global approach is the one which we should go for. There are, of course, uh, limitations to this. Um, and, uh, and until, as you said, it takes time to get it, uh, there are, of course, uh, shortcuts, let's put it this way. And um, they are regionally, so uh, regional earth systems, uh, so regional systems are currently under discussion and uh, being developed um, uh, within Cortex, but also uh, uh, with uh, the user communities. But there are also um, subsystem activities, like, for example, the ocean twins or coastal digital twins, which focus on parts of the system uh, in a more detailed um, manner and which, uh, especially if you look at the ocean, the ocean activities, which are um, strongly guided by the local specific specifications and characteristics. And there is now the challenge to bring all this together to connect what we already know and where the experience is, as Richard mentioned before, in those uh, regional um, or, or, or subsystem components uh, and how to connect this to the global effort. Uh, so I think it is a quite interesting uh, move in the next 10 years to see what's happening here. Thanks. Thanks, Daniela. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how things are there on the floor, Mike, but I was wanting to come back to Regina and I see she's got her hand up. She's probably got a question, but if she had any short reflections 
about the role of society. We started there and we've gone through climate and it would be, I'm keen to hear if you've got any reflections as well, Regina, but anyway, over to you. you have your hand. Yeah, just to say that and then um, uh, as, as we can see that this is gonna take a time and that's what the importance that we see that the climate uh, extremes are coming faster than we think. And that's why we propose alternatives. Meanwhile, in our, you know, we, we have to go both ways, the sophisticated way, but the simple way, because what we're gonna do now until we have these systems in place and that simulated uh, climate well enough for, for the global south. In, and so we have to find alternatives, simple alternatives to work with meanwhile. That's just my 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 comments. And that's a very important comment, Regina. Thank you for making that. And Mike, if it's okay with you, I'll um I'll wrap this up now if that if that's okay because it is um yep. timed up. Yeah, we need to move on to the next session. So yes, yeah. Just... So I just if I can sort of go into minus one minute. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to thank uh well I want to thank all the speakers for keeping to time and for such fantastic talks. They were really very good. So please join with me um virtually or in real in thanking all of our speakers. And I actually also had a very quick comment on the last session. I wanted to thank all of the four speakers for their talks, but also, um, you know, Sonia, your last slide is just so important. You know, I really thank you for reminding us about that. And Jin Yi, you know, we're in Australia, there's other countries as well are dealing with the impact of a, la, of a triple La Nina. And I think looking back is to the combination and exacerbation of risk by, the, by you know, La Nina and climate change will be some very interesting case studies, but we should conclude. So if we could just get my last slide up, that would be wonderful. And I realise I'm probably starting to lose people, but I, apart from thanking everyone for their talks, I did just want to say that we hope to have a summary on the WCRP website, so watch out for that. And then just before I let you go, so on the next slide, I want to warmly invite you to continue the conversation, not over 90 minutes, but over a whole week. In October 2023, WCRP will be holding its Open Science Conference. It will be in Rwanda, in Kigali, in Rwanda, in Africa. And we really welcome you to join us, whether that's in person or from anywhere in the world. Our conference has the goal of advancing climate science for a sustainable future. And it's really an opportunity to not only launch some new science initiatives and alliances, the sorts of things you've heard about today, but to actually have this joint discussion about how we can use science to catalyze some of the rapid climate uh, action that we need and to bridge the gaps between climate science and society and across scientific disciplines and between the global north and the global south. So with that, I will um, hope that you um, might think about joining us in Rwanda. The timeline is on the right hand side. So um, keep an eye out on our website for more developments with the conference. And now I will thank you all for your time, especially to our speakers and wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, everyone. And thanks also to the technical staff for making sure everything ran smoothly. Enjoy the rest of the talk. Thanks, Mike. And thank you to you, Mike, actually, as well, on the floor there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.